A starry sky stretched over the Victorian city. The street lights illuminated the street, and carriages passed along the road. In one of the alleys, a girl was squatting, poking at the garbage with a stick. Among the trash was the body of a man. He was seriously wounded. The girl sat looking at the guy, poking him with a stick when he hissed. The heroine jumped to her feet and recoiled from him, surprised that he was alive. Looking closer at him, the black-haired girl thought his face looked familiar. She remembered that this huge trash was the man who sprinkled the perfect novel with a handful of thriller, obsessed with murder, and the main character, Avalon Lachios. The story took place a few years ago. The main character was an orphan from the slums. She was chased by two men. They were drug dealers. They kidnapped homeless children. The girl managed to run into the empty house, but she ran out of strength and fell. She was found lying on the floor. The drug traffickers ordered her to be seized. The protagonist woke up in a room surrounded by doctors who were conducting experiments on people like her, orphans no one wanted. In the laboratory, they injected her with some unknown substance. She was bleeding from her mouth. The doctors thought she was dying, but they weren't too worried because no one would be looking for her. They were only sorry for the wasted shards. The girl had already accepted her death, but something began to happen to her body. The doctors stood and watched in wonder as the protagonist was wrapped in a cocoon of spider webs. This meant that the experience had worked out. The protagonist woke up to an intense pain that felt like it was tearing her apart. She looked around to see where she was. A huge spider appeared next to her and attacked her. As the girl was running away from him, she noticed a panorama consisting of her past life. In that life, she wasn't an orphan. She had a mom, a dad, and a dog named Coco. The panorama showed a book. The girl remembered it immediately. In this work, she was in love with a minor character. This book she liked so much that she did not forget it, of which she was a little ashamed. Unfortunately, at the end of the panorama, the girl died. She was hit by a truck. The girl could not believe it because she died so simply and ridiculously. It helped the girl wake up. Everyone shouted that the absorption had succeeded. The girl broke the cocoon. A crowd of scientists gathered around her, taking notes on something. For her, time flew by like an instant, but in reality, three years had passed. It turned out that the doctors had injected her with a shard of unknown power. The shard gave the protagonist power over the web, but instead of enhancing all five senses, it erased them, drowning out her emotions. When the girl opened her eyes, the scientists asked her how she was feeling and how her mood was. The girl stared with an embittered look. She remembered how ridiculously she had died in her previous life under a truck, how these scientists in this life had taken away her body because of their experiments. But the girl felt nothing. The girl attacked the humans, using her power. She tried to escape, but the scientists ordered her to be captured. They put a mesh rope on her and put her behind bars. The scientists didn't like Arachne getting stronger, so they decided to isolate her. But there was a sudden explosion. The girl thought she had to run now. She ran towards the exit and came across a group of people staring at something. They were attacked by Lachios. The scientists decided to inform the director immediately. The girl did not feel fear, for her emotions were silenced, but her instincts remained, which told her that the man was to be feared. She clearly felt that if she encountered him, she would die. A blonde-haired man stood there and gave everyone a creepy look. He said they were all going to die. Everyone was screaming to stop Lachios, mentioning the Carnimal family. The black-haired girl stood and digested, hearing familiar words. Lachios and Carnimal. She had seen them in the novel Flower Link. Flower Link is a novel, a thriller that the protagonist read in a past life, and the worst villain in it was exactly Avalon Lachios. The man announced to everyone that the research center was closed from today. The man with the knife came at him and cut his cheek. The girl remembered that Lachios had destroyed the lab without sparing any person working in the lab. About the cases of the girl in the novel was not written. Perhaps she was destined to die at the hands of this man. But fortunately, the protagonist, taking advantage of the sudden chaos, escaped from the laboratory. The girl, looking at the wounded man in the trash heap, thought she always shuddered at the thought of what would have happened if he had caught her. 
the black-haired girl would have liked to be reborn as the mistress of the main aristocrat. Now she is just a semblance of the main character. The main character of Flowerlink was the daughter of a billionaire, but the head of the family got into a shipwreck. It led to the collapse of the family. They began to be persecuted as debtors. But the girl, caught in such a difficult situation, treated everyone with kindness. She met true love, with whom she planned to wait for a happy ending. But because of the main villain, who was now lying in a pile of garbage, everything was drenched in blood. The man killed everyone who got in his way, including the very secondary character the girl was in love with. When the girl found out she had been spawned in the lab, she didn't want to live. But now, the black-haired girl is no longer a helplessly suffocating creature. A spider's web emerged from the protagonist's hand. The girl wanted to kill the main villain, but she was prevented. The door opened, the girl heard it and kicked the man away with her foot so he wouldn't be seen. A girl with white hair appeared out of the door. A girl named Anne-Marie heard the noise and looked out to see who it was. Yuri, the main character, looked at Anne-Marie with one eyebrow raised. It came to her that perhaps Lachios wasn't stalking her, but had come to meet Anne-Marie. Five months ago, a white-haired girl moved into the house next door to Yuri. The girl recognized the main character of the book Flower Link in the neighbor who came to meet her. Anne-Marie told Yuri that they had moved many times, but all the time there were no peers around. She stood with her younger sister, with whom they had a big age difference. The girl with shiny silver hair and green eyes was glad that a girl her age would be living next door to them. The younger sister's name is Hestia. She introduced herself to Yuri. The girl was now sure that it was not a mistake, and the main character of the novel was standing in front of her. But the girl didn't remember such a thing being in a book. They stood opposite each other and were silent. Anne-Marie looked at the black-haired girl and did not understand why she was silent. Yuri was remembering the events in the book. In the novel, the fate of the main character was terrible, but she still saves Lachios, who fell right in front of her house. A bond appears between them. The man, after learning about the people who hurt Anne-Marie, killed out of all of them. In the second half, the girl with silver hair saves Lachios again, but quickly regretted it. The girl sat with her hands on her head. Jury didn't want to get involved with Anne-Marie. The green-eyed girl told the protagonist that she heard from her neighbor about her job at the biggest coffee shop. The girl answered Anne-Marie rather rudely. The white-haired girl was startled and thought that no sooner had they met than she was asking her personal questions. The girl feared she had been too rude. Anne-Marie said she planned to work at the treatment center across from the cafe. Apparently, she was amused by the fact that they were neighbors across the street and would be working across the street from each other. Yuri, looking at the girl, thought she saw her dog Coco. She looked so cute and defenseless. The protagonist reassured Anne-Marie and confirmed that they would indeed see each other often. The white-haired girl brightened. She was glad that she had not offended Yuri and that she had accepted her. She looked at the house across the street where Anne-Marie had moved. She remembered that the novel had spoken of a dilapidated house, but this house could not be called that. The house was sturdy and looked solid. Anne-Marie was rich, after all. The white-haired woman came to Yuri's house to invite her to dinner, but the girl had to refuse because she had already eaten. They heard a loud noise. Anne-Marie hurried to leave because most likely something was broken and she better go and find out what it was. The girl ran off in the direction of her house. Yuri stood and squinted at her suspiciously. She wondered what might happen to the main villain if he came to the wrong house. In the original, Lachios was lying in front of Anne-Marie's house. The protagonist wondered if everything was going to be okay from this point on in the story. A spider's web appeared from her hand, and from that moment she was connected to Anne-Marie. In her thoughts, Yuri asked Anne-Marie not to blame her, because she wasn't even mentioned in the book, and the novel should have a proper development. The web began to form into something incomprehensible, but then the girl was interrupted by Anne-Marie. The girl and her sister baked cookies. Since Yuri always treats Hestia, they decided to make her a treat too. The protagonist of the whole situation brought back memories of the cute puppy Coco, who also brought Yuri a present in the form of a shabby hair toy. Sister Anne-Marie was watching from the window. The black-haired girl promised that she would eat it all, 
The white-haired girl was happy and wanted to leave, but Yuri stopped her. With a creepy face, she warned Anne-Marie not to go out so late, even if she heard a noise, because the neighborhood wasn't safe. But the green-eyed girl cheerfully announced that the sound of footsteps was similar to Yuri's. The girl didn't stop, because it could be faked by someone. Anne-Marie wondered if such a person existed. Yuri thought of Lakios, who was lying outside her house. Yuri gave Anne-Marie one last warning and the latter, promising to be more careful next time, went off to her room. The protagonist looked sadly at the plate of cookies. As soon as the man is in front of Anne-Marie's house, the thriller begins. The girl did not understand for what sins of the main character of the novel Lakios was so addicted to her that he wanted to remove all the people around the lovely girl, kidnap her, and keep her near him. He even planned to kill Hestia. The black-haired girl couldn't leave it like that, so she decided to finally finish what she had planned. The spider's web came out of her hand again. The main villain of the novel was lying on the couch in Yuri's house. His shirt was covered in blood. The girl stood beside him and looked at the wounds. They had gotten bigger, probably because the girl had kicked him. Yuri came to the conclusion that they were aiming specifically at deadly places that even Anne-Marie would barely be able to handle. Anne-Marie was not the spawn of the lab's experiments, but she, like Yuri, has the power of shards. The substance that appeared in the central part of the continent broke into shards. They shattered and leaked to the people. Many people died from the side effects. But Anne-Marie didn't die. She received the power of healing. This power is similar to that of the relics, but the protagonist has been forcibly given it. Anne-Marie's healing power, which has awakened on its own, is different from Yuri's. And that's why Lakios, a hater of human experiments, became so attached to the white-haired girl. The girl used the web to pull a bottle from the shelf. She put a plate on the table and the bottle next to it. She also used the cobwebs to tear the man's shirt. A view of the deep wounds opened up. He had three wounds on his side, chest and neck. Yuri began to treat them. Lakios was unconscious, but still squinting in pain. She wondered if Anne-Marie's story would repeat itself, if he would fall in love with her if she helped him instead of the novel's protagonist. The black-haired girl finished disinfecting and began the operation. Using the same web, the girl sat and sewed up the man's wounds. She quickly sewed up the wounds and thought she would take the medicine from Anne-Marie for the next day. There were people sitting at tables in the room. Yuri was at work. She stood and wiped the table. Everyone in the cafe was looking at her. The girl looked beautiful when she was worried. The guys kept looking at her. The girl ran the errands she was given at work, all the while thinking about Lakios. The customers were whispering among themselves about Yuri. They thought something was bothering her. In the novel Flower Link, it is described that rich aristocrats divided the country into eastern, western, southern, and northern parts to govern it. The protagonist herself lives in the east, which is under the control of Carlian Crockford's family. The girl has chosen the comforts of civilization. Another aristocrat from the East, who was an outstanding alchemist, developed convenient devices, such as refrigerator, gas stove electricity, and so on. All this could only have been invented by Eastern alchemists. These devices are not used in other parts of the world, for they are forbidden to be exported. The bartender noticed that the girl looked very pensive. He asked her if everything was all right, Thanks to her, the cafe had a lot of customers, and if anything, they could hire another employee so they wouldn't overstretch her. The girl admitted that she was doing fine. She just hadn't gotten enough sleep for personal reasons, Lakios, to be exact. Anne-Marie walked into the cafe. The girl offered her coffee. The white-haired girl came to give Yuri the medicine she had asked for. The black-haired girl thanked Anne-Marie and asked how much she owed. The green-eyed girl didn't charge her anything, since she always comes in for a cup of delicious tea. Anne-Marie sat at the bar and drank the delicious hot tea that Yuri served her. All the visitors were captivated by her beauty. The white-haired girl offered to keep her company after work. But Yuri, seeing the beautifully glowing yellow butterfly, said she had an appointment, so she couldn't go with Anne-Marie. The girl was upset, and then Yuri offered to go together next time. Anne-Marie happily agreed. On the street, the girl said goodbye. The protagonist turned around to the place where the same butterfly was. A note appeared in the sky. It was a mission. In the evening, after work, 
Yuri, after quickly saying goodbye to her boss, hurried to the meeting place. She works at the coffee shop from morning to night, but when night falls, she goes on errands for the dark world. The girl from behind attacked the unsuspecting men using a web she wrapped them in cocoons. The men didn't even have time to say a word. The girl didn't want her powers, but she felt bad that they would go unused, so she spent them for good, to survive. Yuri walked into a room full of men with weapons. The girl smiled at them and quickly dispersed them thanks to her web. As the black-haired woman finished with the poor people, she pondered Anne-Marie. Why she looked like Coco, why she'd given her house to her and how much it was worth. The man in the web began to move and moo something. Yuri wanted nothing more than to buy a nice house, eat good food, and just live happily. She turned to the captive. If men were submissive, they wouldn't be in this situation. The girl pulled out a knife, and the man's tears welled up when he saw the weapon. The webbed men were moving and mooing even more vigorously. They were tied to the ceiling, and now Yuri wanted to cut their webs. She assured them that they would not die from this height. The man was able to tear up the cobwebs and blurted out that they would tell everything. The girl was worried about the whereabouts of the documents she had come for. The papers were at the bottom of the stairs. The girl, thanking the prisoner, cut his webbing. But not letting it fall, she caught it at the bottom. Yuri found the documents and walked away from that building, leaving the men to get out of the web themselves. The girl was walking through the night city. She didn't feel like going home at all, because Lachios was waiting for her there, who was pissing her off. But Yuri had to go home. She opened the door with thoughts of leaving him to die after all. The man was lying on the sofa, covered with a plaid. The girl stood looking at him. The black-haired girl reached out to him, but suddenly the man grabbed her wrist and pulled her toward him. Yuri, who hadn't expected the blonde to wake up, couldn't help herself and fell on top of Lachios. The man stared at her with surprised eyes. It's night. The lights are on in the windows and on the street. A man can barely walk, leaving behind drops of blood. Somewhere, something is being said. Everything seems loud to the man. The blonde man from losing a lot of blood couldn't walk further. He was tired and decided to take a little break. The man slid down the wall to the floor and passed out. Lachios was constantly being called out by someone and told to get up. It was too loud, so when he woke up, the blonde grabbed Yuri's arm and yelled in a whisper, loud. The man who didn't expect to see the girl was very surprised. The black-haired woman was startled. She thought he was already awake, but looking closer, she realized that Lachios had just reflexively opened his eyes. She released her hand from his grip and laid him back on the couch. She released her hand from his grip and laid him back on the couch. Lachios had squeezed the girl's arm so hard that she was left with a bruise, and the wounds from the strain she had been so diligently treating had opened and were bleeding. The main character was looking out the window. She didn't look good. She had bruises under her eyes. Yuri can't sleep because of the threat to her life. Lachios was lying behind him. He opened his eyes and saw the girl. He thought she was very beautiful. The black-haired girl asked how the body was doing. The man stared at her with admiring eyes. The girl looked at him incomprehensibly. It seemed to her that the atmosphere had changed. She had warned him not to get up because of the wounds that might open. The man spoke in a whisper because he had a neck injury. Yuri reminded him what happened two days ago. But Lachios didn't listen to her. He was still admiring her. The girl had to leave for work. She said before leaving that if he wanted to sleep, he could sleep. But if he wanted to leave, he could leave. Lachios, when Yuri left, came to his senses. It was strange to him that the landlady would just walk away, leaving a strange man alone in the house. It was also strange that she left bread for a sick man. The blonde man wondered if the landlady was good-natured or still a heartless person. Lachios's inner demon spoke. It asked if he was alive. The man wondered why it was necessary to yell like that. But the demon was just worried about him. The demon was afraid that Lachios would die, for if the master died, he would die too. The inner demon asks him to be more careful. The demon stammered that he had been very lucky. But Lachios remembered with crazed eyes that the child he trusted most had stuck a knife in his back. But the demon reminded the man that he had been warned many times that he would betray him. 
he was just blind. All the accusations and name-calling fell on Lachios's head. The man agreed with him and went back to bed. He himself knew that he would get the power. The blonde thought he had completely destroyed the lab along with all the people. But the demon offered him help, but he didn't agree. The inner demon noticed that the man was fascinated by the girl, his heart beating like crazy. He suggested that she might be his ideal. The blonde man blushed, the demon exulted, heart thudding. Lachios asked the demon to shut up, but it was taunting him. The man strained to answer the inner demon, causing the blonde man's wounds to open. The girl walked down the street tensely. She felt that someone was following her. She figured out her stalker. Yuri took a quick step and headed around the corner. The man followed her but came to a dead end. A black-haired girl attacked him from behind. She attacked him with a web and strung him up. The girl promised to come back later, for she had a busy day. A raven was watching the whole situation. Anne-Marie sat in front of Lachios and applied a bandage to him. The girl introduced herself and asked the man for his name. The blonde tapped her on the arm. The girl's bandages fell out. The white-haired girl didn't expect that such an innocuous question could anger the injured man so much. Lachios said that just because she put the bandage on didn't mean she had done him any favors. The man grabbed Anne-Marie by the neck. He had warned her better to stay away from him, and even his poor health didn't prevent him from massacring her here and now. But it was all just a recollection of the events of the protagonist's book. Yuri sat on a chair in front of the injured man. Lachios was worse than he had been in the morning. The girl shook the man by the shoulders to bring him to his senses. The black-haired woman removed the bandage placed on his side. She was surprised to notice that the wounds were healing quickly. His condition had improved a lot in two days. Yuri thought that perhaps he couldn't be categorized as a mere human. He was the main villain of the novel, after all. Or perhaps he, too, had the power of a rune shard. But it wasn't mentioned in the book. But Lachios doesn't look like he can take down an entire lab by himself. Perhaps there have been changes in the country, and most likely things will not happen as they did in the book. Yuri couldn't understand what this could possibly have to do with her, even if she were to die at the hands of this villain. The girl took the shirt in her hands and considered it. She wondered if the clothes she had bought for work would fit the man. Yuri reflected that it would be nice to get a cash reward for nursing her back to health, unless, of course, Dakio snapped her neck. The man opened his eyes and sat up abruptly on the bed, pain shooting up his side. Lacus noticed the girl sitting at his feet, resting her head on the couch. Yuri had fallen asleep. The blonde decided to touch the girl's hair. Yuri felt someone touching her. She raised her head and moved her hand so that their hands touched. When the girl touched Lachios's hand, she experienced an inexplicable feeling. But how could she experience feelings if they had been erased in the lab? A tear rolled down Yuri's cheek. The girl was touched by the fact that for the first time in a long time, she felt warmth and joy. The man blushed all over. He too was experiencing the same feelings as the girl. Lachios couldn't control it. He thought it was all the work of his inner worm. The blonde couldn't take it anymore, so he yanked his hand away. But the black-haired woman grabbed his wrist. She didn't want him to leave. Lachios was surprised. He tried again to remove Yuri's hand, asking her to wait. But the girl was so caught up in these feelings, which she hadn't experienced in so long, that she had no control over what she was doing. She reached for the man again, but caught her foot on the table, a glass on it which flew off and shattered into small shards on impact. The protagonist piled on top of Lachios, who was distraught. The protagonist only now realized that the situation was, to put it mildly, not good. Yuri lay on top of Lachios. The girl wrapped her arms around the man's hand. She didn't want to let him go at all. But the blonde whispered in embarrassment, as his throat had not yet recovered, that it would be better if she let go of his hand. The girl blushed, realizing what she was doing. She let go of the man's hand and began to apologize nervously. Yuri immediately felt that all the emotion was gone. She couldn't feel anything anymore. She was saddened by this. The girl apologized to Lachios more calmly. The man wanted to say something as his wounded throat made itself known. He quickly turned his head, found a paper and pencil, and began to write quickly. Lachios texted the girl that he was not unpleasant, and everything was fine, and that he was the one who had behaved tactlessly. The man thanked Yuri for her help. 
the girl said that it was necessary to help neighbors, even though he was not her neighbor. The blonde man was touched. He texted the girl that he could still stay a few days at her place because he hadn't fully recovered yet. The girl looking at him thought how she could refuse him when he was asking with such a lovey-dovey face. Yuri also remembered the feeling she had experienced from touching Lakios. She was sure it was something she needed to find out right away. So the black-haired woman let him stay at her place until he fully recovered. The man was surprised that she had agreed so quickly. The girl thought she'd be more vigilant with him and wanted to leave, but Lakios grabbed Yuri so that she turned back to him. The black-haired girl already thought that the blonde's true nature had shown itself, but the man only wanted to know the name of his savior. The girl said her name. Lakios wrote that it suited her very well. The girl thanked him. The man looked as pleased as a cat. The blonde man, without waiting for the girl to ask his name, wrote what his name was. The girl said he had a pretty name and told him to go to bed. Lakios had that compliment in his mind now and he was embarrassed. The demon laughed in his head. The man was angry. He thought the worm had used the sharding ability and after all, he had warned that it was forbidden to do so in public. But the worm denied everything. He didn't do anything. The demon admitted that the moment they touched each other was strange. A man with red hair lay bleeding on the pavement. Lachios himself was hovering over him. The blonde man was apparently fighting the red-haired man named Zenas Sheldon for something. He kicked the man in the face. Zenes grabbed the blonde man's leg with his last strength and asked him not to touch Hestia and Anne-Marie. Lachios grinned at him and grabbed his hair, telling him that the sisters were in a place he had prepared for them himself. Lachios confessed that he was the one who had kidnapped Hestia, and Sheldon didn't even realize it. The man with the crazy eyes killed Zenes Sheldon. The girl woke up abruptly and sat up in bed. It had been a dream. Yuri had dreamed about her beloved Zenas Sheldon, but she couldn't remember the details very well. It was a disgusting feeling. The black-haired girl walked out of the room into the hallway. She stretched after her nap and noticed that the room was dark. Using the cobwebs, she wanted to pull the curtains apart, but the cobwebs came back up. Turning her head, she noticed Lachios sitting on the couch. He looked at the girl with a grim gaze. Yuri felt an electric shock as she realized that Lachios had seen her abilities. The black-haired girl asked him how he was feeling. The man was so quiet that the girl forgot he existed. Yuri walked over to the curtains to pull them open. Lachios had texted her that everything was fine. She didn't have to worry. The girl hid around the corner, fearfully hoping that if there was no reaction to her power, then he hadn't noticed anything. She decided not to use her powers at home for the time being. The man was still sitting on the couch and looked in the direction where Yuri was standing. Meanwhile, Worm had seen the girl use force. He asked his host if he had seen it, but the blonde man didn't care about that. He was embarrassed to see the girl in her pajamas. The demon was angry, for that was not what was important right now. He told Lachios that he had seen something glistening from the girl that was leaking from her hand. The blonde man had seen everything. The girl returned with a tray in her hands. Yuri brought the man something to eat, something other than bread, for it would be hard for him to eat. Lachios looked at the plate in anticipation. The man was disappointed when he saw the contents. The tureen was a black slurry with octopus tentacles and a whole piece of beet, the blonde man asked in a whisper what it was. Yuri said, as if nothing had happened, that it was a seafood stew, very healthy. The inner demon was excited that Lachios would eat it, for it looked suspicious. The worm was sure the man would die if he ate it, but the blonde reminded him that even if Lachios drank the poison, he wouldn't die. The man took a spoon and tasted the deadly soup. Lachios almost died. It took a huge amount of effort for him not to spit the soup back into his plate, but he managed to pull himself together and showed the girl class. Yuri noticed that he didn't like it, but still put it on the table, said to eat as much as possible to make him heal quickly, and hurriedly left. Half an hour later, the plates were empty. Lachios lay down on the couch. The man didn't feel well. He decided to find some medicine for himself. The blonde came to the kitchen to find something for digestion, but all the drawers were empty. The man saw a door. 
He opened it and saw many mannequins standing with their heads down. The man was shocked. The demon was sure she was strange. It was a clear day. Yuri was walking to work and eating a loaf on the way. She wondered what was wrong with the soup. As she passed by an alley, the girl remembered that she had to deal with the guy who was stalking her. She arrived at the spot where she had left the stalker, but found him dead. Apparently, the person who sent the poor guy had found him before the protagonist did. Yuri sat down to get a better look at the wounds. They looked familiar. From the wounds, the girl realized who it could be. A vital organ severed, the kind of handwriting not common to those who want to stay in the shadows. She decided to teach him a lesson. The girl was at work and was taking an order from a guy with bangs over his eyes. He had a sunflower in his hands. The guy was trying to attract the girl's attention by giving her various compliments. The man showed her his sunflower, then the girl could not stand it and answered the guy that she did not accept gifts. But Snow wasn't going to give it to her. He just decided to show it to her. The girl was even angrier. Yuri guessed what the guy wanted to order. He didn't lose sight of that and told her she was interested in him, but he still wouldn't give up the sunflower. The girl walked away from him saying she wasn't interested in him and wouldn't take a sunflower. Yuri looked at him suspiciously. He was a regular visitor. He had long bangs over his eyes that hid the color of his eyes. Violet eyes just like her favorite minor character, the protector of the East, Xenos Sheldon. The girl remembered what he was like in the novel. Whenever the protagonist needed help, he appeared out of nowhere, like a ghost, and became her support. Friendly, sometimes playful and even sexy, he was nothing like this regular visitor. Zeno Sheldon was dropped from the novel. He was called the Eastern Protector. Before he met Anne-Marie, he kept his name and appearance hidden. Yuri had been following that guy for a while, but he seemed like a simple bum. The guy with the bangs walked over to the counter where the black-haired girl was. He said goodbye, saying he needed to water Lagi, his sunflower. Anne-Marie came into the cafe. The guy looked at her. The protagonist concluded that if it was really that minor character, he wouldn't pass Anne-Marie by so easily. As the white-haired girl started to say why she had come, the girls heard a shout from the street. It was the same guy. The man in charge of the coffee shop came out and said that birds were constantly defecating on his head outside the coffee shop. The boss came out and handed the guy a napkin. A raven was watching them. The girl thought that this guy couldn't possibly be Zenos Sheldon. Yuri turned to Anne-Marie, reminding her that she had come to see her for something. The white-haired girl had come to the coffee shop to recount a conversation she had overheard at the hospital. People have started disappearing in the city. Against the bridge at the shelter on Red Pirate Street, kids are going missing. So she came to warn her to be careful in those places. Yuri stared fearfully at Anne-Marie, for the disappearance from the orphanage is like the event that epitomizes the beginning of a novel. At night, the main character appeared in the cemetery. She called Leo. It was a child werewolf. The kid took the form of a human and threw himself at the girl with hugs. The girl said that she was not angry with him, but he had done wrong. Yuri reprimanded the boy, saying that you can't eat everyone who follows her. Eating dirty things can give you indigestion, and you can't eat the same things at the same time. The child stood and listened to her with sad, tear-stained eyes. The girl asked him to think about it, because next time she would be very angry with him. The kid apologized to Yuri. The girl realized that the kid one day, in another impulse, would not be able to defeat the beast in him. She needed to tell him to be careful. Leo is the victim of an experiment. He was with Yuri in the lab. At the age of 13, he was experimented on and his growth stopped. If the experiment was unsuccessful, animal instincts begin to override reason. Such mistakes by the doctor were not uncommon. Leo didn't come alone. A guy with a scar on his lips appeared out of the raven's guise. The girl and Odin hadn't seen each other for a long time. He asked her why she had come. Yuri appeared to tell her something. Raven rejoiced. She asked him to look into the current situation in Karnamal. The boy hesitated. He remembered the rumors associated with that family. There were rumors about a king of the dark world who died due to illness, and his son who killed all his rivals and took the throne. It was the first time the girl had heard about it in her current life. 
She also said that there was a guy who was stalking her. Yuri is sure that a person from the dark world is involved, so she asks Raven to find out. It was an easy thing for the guy to do. One turned to the werewolf. He accused him of killing his stalker, Leo growled at him. Odin kept taunting the guy, telling him not to act like a puppy. Yuri was stopped by Raven. She gave him a grim look and asked him not to be rude to Leo. The boy stifled himself and admitted that he had overreacted. The girl wanted to leave, promising Odin that she would repay him as always. The boy stopped her, for they had not seen each other for a long time, and he felt lonely. The guy was clearly flirting with her, hovering over her and picking up a strand of her hair, asking her where she was in a hurry and if she had important things to do. The main character lied when she said she had a cat. The guys jumped away from her in fright. Apparently, they didn't like cats. The girl said she decided to take charge. Yuri used the web, but before she left, she asked Odin not to shit on the guests of the coffee house. The boy bowed his head and agreed not to do it again. The black-haired woman left the boys. When they were alone, Odin asked if he believed Arachne had a pet. The werewolf shook his head in the negative. Raven made sure he wasn't the only one who thought so. The guy said he would never reach Yuri. He didn't understand why she liked small animals. Odin turned to Leo and said he was having a hard time putting up with that dog. The werewolf growled angrily at him, but Odin had already turned into a raven and flew away. Leo thought about catching the cat, but at one point he remembered Yuri's terrifyingly grim look and stopped fearfully. There was no catching anyone after all. He retreated deep into the forest and curled up, covering himself with his tail. The main character walked into her house. The first thing she saw was Lachios, who was sitting on the couch and had already written to her on a piece of paper, Welcome back. The girl, taking off her cloak, inquired about his body. Yuri had a strange feeling, for it had been a long time since anyone had greeted her when she returned home. Lachios was feeling fine thanks to the black-haired girl. In the trash can, the girl saw a vial that said, For digestion. She picked up the tray of empty plates, wondering if it was a good thing that he ate everything or not. Inner Worm smelled a beastly odor from the girl. The man was angry. He was curious about what she was doing. This smell was not like that of a stray cat. Lachios glared at Yuri, but when she turned to him, he immediately changed his face, looking embarrassed. The protagonist told him that he could ask for whatever he needed so he didn't have to get up. Worm was setting the man up to ask for her help and he was using the power of the relic to learn the girl's essence. The girl waited, waiting for something to say. Lachios wrote that he needed to change his clothes and he was asking for her help in doing so. Yuri stood confused by such a request. The man got worried and wrote that she could refuse, but the girl said yes and already began fiercely unbuttoning his shirt buttons. Even the inner worm was shocked by the girl's pressure. When the blonde man asked her to help him change, the girl saw her chance. Yuri remembered that strange feeling when their hands had touched, and she wanted to find out what it was. Now was the best moment. After all, Lachios was injured. So when the man offered her to refuse, the girl pounced sharply to help him. While the protagonist was straightening her shirt, the blonde was admiring the girl. Yuri thought about how she could take his hand again but then the man didn't wait long. He intercepted her hands with both hands, asking her to wait. The girl plunged back into those feelings she had experienced the first time they touched. Lachios, sitting down on the couch, stopped the girl because he could undo the buttons himself. The blonde wanted to take his hand away. Yuri wasn't satisfied with that. She wondered how she could take his hand one more time the black-haired girl imagined what would happen if she just put her hands on his chest. She imagined the horrible scene of Lachio slitting the protagonist's neck in a fit of rage. She was sure that was what would happen. So she pretended to feel dizzy and fell on top of the man. Her inner demon reminded her that this was a chance to find out. The blonde man placed his hand on Yuri's forehead. The man suggested that it might be because of him. The girl was enveloped in feelings again, and she raised her head at him and nestled into his hand. She said that she would rest a bit now, and everything would be fine. The girl was warm. She liked it. She had the feeling that she had regained something she had lost long ago. 
Yuri didn't understand how she lived without feelings. She sat in front of Lachios and enjoyed these magical sensations. The man had already forgotten why he'd started all this, but the worm didn't let him forget. The inner demon demanded to use the power of the relics and find out the girl's essence. Yuri's tears were coming. He took his hand away. The protagonist got up from the couch, promising that she would bring a change of clothes right away. The worm was pestering Lachios. He didn't understand why he didn't use force. The blonde didn't want to do such an inhuman thing to the girl after all. She nursed him back to health and helped him all the time. The demon wouldn't stop, and Lachios was getting angry. The worm demanded that the blonde man touch Yuri again, that he find out for himself. He asked the man to show all his charm to touch the girl for much longer. The demon demanded to seduce Yuri with his body. At this request, Lachios choked on his water. The worm laughed at him. The man didn't let him get away with it so easily, and said he would find the relic to destroy the pesky worm for good. As the girl went shopping for clothes, she wondered if these feelings were not an illusion. Yuri recalled that the actions in the novel were described on Anne Marie's behalf. There was nothing detailed about Lachios. Perhaps she had missed something, and he too had the power of shards. Either there had been a change in this country. A large moon loomed over the city. A raven flew across the sky toward the huge castle. He lowered himself onto the railing. There were many people standing in the huge hall. One of the men bowed to some man who was displeased that they could not catch the man who was on the verge of death. The man on the floor was desperately begging for another chance. The magnanimous host, giving one last chance, poured wine on the man's head. He was given ten days to find the fugitive. Raven was able to get a glimpse of the master. It was the main villain of the novel, Lachios, and he asked to bring him a fake copy of him. The girl was walking down the street and thinking about what had happened. Yuri was called. It was Anne-Marie. She offered to go together about work. The main character decided to check what would happen if she took the white-haired girl's hand. The girl offered to shake hands. Anne-Marie jumped with joy and agreed, grabbing the protagonist's hand. As expected, nothing happened, but the girl realized for sure that this was only happening to Lakisos. There's a spring festival coming up this weekend, so Anne-Marie decided to invite Yuri to go to it together. The white-haired girl asked the girl if she had already gone to the festival, since she had lived in the city, since she had lived in the city longer. Yuri went to the festival, but only as Arachne on work. In the East, this holiday is considered the biggest festival of the year. It's also when a mystery auction opens in the shadows. One of the regular customers asked Yuri to buy his goods for him every year as a proxy. Anne-Marie was going to go to the festival with her sister. She asked the main character if she would mind. But the girl had to refuse. She will have business that day. After all, this regular client would assign the task this time too. Anne-Marie was very upset. Yuri realized that she had refused too harshly. The main character recalled the events of the novel. Because of the disappearances in the asylum, Anne-Marie crosses paths with the main male character. But there was no separate description about the festival. And yet, there was an episode where she was chased by some madman during the fall harvest, so you can't relax. Also, the town is now home to Lachios Avalon. The girl assumes that something terrible might happen at the festival, so Yuri promises that she'll join them when she's done with work. The white-haired girl was happy. She agreed even if the protagonist had to stay late and come late. The girls agreed to meet in front of the clock tower. Anne-Marie was worried that if there were a lot of people there, then it would take them a long time to find each other. But Yuri reassured her, saying that wherever she was, the black-haired girl would be able to find her. The white-haired woman was embarrassed by such a confession. She agreed to meet near the tower. Yuri set a time. They agreed, and before they left, Anne-Marie grabbed Yuri's hand with both hands. The girl enjoyed shaking the black-haired girl's hand and wished her a good day, and left. Lachios looked out from behind the curtain to the window. The man was about to go outside, the worm insisting that his body hadn't recovered properly yet. But the blonde couldn't sit idly by because of this. He was already dressed when the worm remembered to make sure he drank some more digestive medicine. He was starting to feel nauseous. Along with the demon, Lachios was getting nauseous as well. Before leaving for work, the girl made the same soup for Lachios again. 
He ate every last drop of it again. Worm called the man stubborn, but the blonde claimed that the girl had tried, so it was impossible to just leave that soup. He took the medicine and drank it. The worm remembered the grave. It was the first time he had tasted something like this since he had eaten food while in the grave. Lachios, clutching the bottle, smashed it. The man apparently had a trigger for the word grave. The blonde stared madly in front of him. He asked the worm if he knew why the place was called grave. The demon didn't know that. It's called that place because no one gets out of there alive. Lachios, when he was just a child, had been placed there by his father as a test subject. He ended up with a noisy parasite. Lachios survived and presents in front of his terrified father. The man caught his son as he climbed out of the grave. The boy was the only one to escape from the grave. He spent five years there. Lachios killed everyone who helped put him there, including his father. The worm became uneasy. The blonde was sure that to get rid of the shameful moments, it would be enough to simply destroy everything connected with him. After the story, Lachios was determined to go and find the traitor to give him a fitting end. The blonde man sat on the roof of the building and watched Yuri. The girl was serving visitors. Worm reminded him that they had sort of gone looking for the traitor, but Lachios admitted that his body still ached from moving around. Then the demon didn't understand why they had come to watch the black-haired girl. The man explained to the short-sighted fellow in his head that the girl might come back while he was away, so they came to see if she was okay and at work. It had been 40 minutes since Lachios had watched Yuri. He didn't notice how much time had passed as he watched her hair fluttering behind her back. He liked looking at her, but the people sitting in the cafe talking to Yuri annoyed him. Men and girls offered the black-haired woman to go to the festival with them, but she refused, saying that she had business to attend to and did not want to go. But then the face of one of the visitors seemed familiar to Lachios. It was the same regular customer with long bangs over his eyes. The guy started talking to the girl. He heard that the girl had an appointment and he wanted to go to the festival too. But the man didn't finish. He got a sudden headache. The girl got worried and ran up to him. The guy managed to pretend it was okay, accusing the girl of looking too dazzling. Lachios got angry. The guy with the bangs left the payment and left the coffee shop. Stepping outside, he grabbed his eyes. Guy had a vision of the face of the alchemist, Damon Salvatore, as he looked at Miss Yuri. Guy was sure it was a premonition. Maybe they would meet at the festival. The flaky guy didn't want to go to the festival, but he changed his mind, the guy looking at the girl in the window of the coffee shop, thinking that he would still have to get out to the festival after a long time. As the bangs man disappeared from sight, the man on the roof jerked up. He had a distinct realization that he'd seen him somewhere. The worm tossed him a recent memory where a girl had told one of the visitors that she already had an appointment. Lachios was angry. He was interested in who Jury was going to the festival with. Jury came to the conclusion that he must find some sign. The man climbed down from the roof. He needed to find the sign left by the people of the underworld. Then he could give them an errand. The people of the underworld have a habit of leaving signs in sacred places, opposite to the darkness that is their root. The blonde man had noticed 24 signs already, but the one he wanted was not among them. He was looking for the information merchant of the underworld, Raven Odin. But then the raven attacked Lachios from behind. The man grabbed it by the throat, but it immediately disappeared. The blonde man, Realizing that it was an unusual bird, now knew that he was using the raven, not the feather, as a sign. Now he had found what he was looking for and could have given him an errand, but the attempt was a failure. One surrounded by crows was furious, for some ignorant man had destroyed his crow. Odin recalled that the man's movements were crisp and quick, so he couldn't even get a good look at him. The guy thought who it could be, and to check under the guise of a raven would be suspicious. Odin decided that Arachne's request was more important than anything else, so he turned into a raven and flew to Karnamal. He decided that as soon as he was done, he would get rid of the newcomer. In the evening, Lachios was already at home. He was lying on the couch under a blanket. The girl returned from work, immediately inquiring about his well-being. Yuri promised to cook dinner. 
The man grimaced, remembering the soup from the girl it did not go unnoticed. She placed the bag, which contained some bread, on the table. Lachios was very happy about that. Yuri said that if it wasn't enough, she would cook something, but the man shook his head negatively. The girl noticed that the medicine box was missing a bottle of digestive aid. Yuri realized that Lachios didn't want to eat, but he could have just told her that. The black-haired girl noticed something else. The protagonist had attached thin strings to each corner of the windows and doors just in case, but one had broken off. Yuri realized that Lachios was going outside. The girl placed the tray on the table, noticing that the man looked like a well-trained large dog. The blonde man took the loaf in his hands, but didn't eat it right away. He offered it to the girl. Yuri was embarrassed. She remembered Anne-Marie and Lachios, thinking they made people's hearts soften. But the girl, eating a loaf, remembered that she would be coming home late on Saturday. The blonde man was not happy about it. The girl noticed it. But the man immediately changed his frowning expression to an animated and cheerful one. The protagonist thought she was imagining it. It's a clear, warm day. The girl has gone to work. At home alone, Lachios was left all glum and angry. He remembered the girl in the cafe when she said she had an appointment. The blonde kept thinking about who she would go to the party with. The girl was walking down a street decorated with flags and garlands. Yuri found herself near the ruins of a cemetery. Leo called out to her cheerfully. The black-haired girl wondered if he was good at keeping the things she'd left him. The werewolf said he hadn't taken her things. She noticed that Odin hadn't shown up yet. A mask and cloak were in the basket. Yuri changed into men's clothes. The girl said she had an assignment and, putting the mask on her face, asked the boy to look after her clothes, and she would buy him melon candy in return. Leo happily waved goodbye to the main character. The werewolf noticed a glittering city in the distance, prepared for a celebration. The werewolf wanted to go there too. There was a festival going on in the city. The masked girl headed towards the secret auction room. Mostly wealthy people went there, so you couldn't get in without a special invitation. Yuri approached the guy who was checking the passes. He asked the protagonist for her ID card, a small gold plate with the sign of the auction room. The girl showed him the card and went inside. The girl was approached by a rich old man who wanted to get a valuable object that would be auctioned at the very last auction. The black-haired girl did not want to attract a lot of attention, so she changed into a man. But still, she was noticed by the nobles. The guests were curious about what family he was from. Suddenly, an argument broke out between the two men. The guy with blue hair didn't like the masks they had come in and blamed his companion. The guy in a fit of anger did not notice the girl and pushed her. His mask came undone and revealed his face for a moment. The blue-haired man immediately put his mask back on, but Yuri took enough time to examine him. The blue hair and black eyes reminded her of the alchemist, Damon Salvatore. The guy kept reprimanding his friend for the mask. The man excused himself, saying that there were only masks with the image of a frog left. The auction began, and one by one, things began to appear on the stand. A precious sword from an ancient kingdom, a necklace that had received the curse of a legendary animal living in the north. But none of these things suited the girl. But finally, the last slot has appeared. This item was created by a legendary alchemist that can resurrect the dead and turn stone into gold. Everyone froze in anticipation. When the item was finally shown, even the girl stared at it in shock. The presenter called it the Philosopher's Stone, but the girl knew that it wasn't a Philosopher's Stone at all. It was a shard with incredible power that had been injected into her in the lab. The guests whispered in disbelief. They did not believe that this was a philosopher's stone that could bring people back to life and turn stone into gold. They demanded proof that this stone could really raise the dead. The host announced to the guests that those who were suspicious might not participate in the auction. He also warned that only the best alchemist would be able to activate this jewel, so those who had no ties to the tower had better not win the auction. The bidding started at one billion gold. The alchemist's tower that the host was referring to was the place where the alchemist's research was conducted. Their services were very expensive, 
so not many people could afford to run errands for them. The presenter's words could be considered an insult. The richest aristocrat's pride was hurt. They sat and stared angrily at the stage, whispering among themselves. A guy with red hair, wearing a deer mask, raised his hand and offered a billion gold pieces. The girl looked at him and thought he was a fake. Suddenly, abruptly, a guy with blue hair and a frog mask shouted a higher price. The people sitting next to him recognized him. A girl shouted out that it was Damon Salvatore. The man was caught red-handed. One of the guests rose from his seat and stared at Damon. His companion said that he should have at least worn a wig. All the people immediately perked up, because if the most famous and talented alchemist wanted to buy the Philosopher's Stone, it had to be real. Higher and higher prices came from all corners. People were eager to get their hands on the magic stone. Damon offered the highest price, and he called the guests' names and announced that it wasn't the Philosopher's Stone. People didn't believe him, because he wanted to buy the jewel too. The girl who was observing everything in the hall had to participate in the bidding as well. But this item was being implanted in her and other subjects for the sake of the experiment, so she couldn't just give this shard to a customer without knowing who he was. Therefore, the girl directed her web directly to the stage to retrieve the stone. Panic and commotion began in the hall. Guards were called to protect the philosopher's stone. But today, the girl acted as a righteous thief, so while all the guests were rushing to the exit, she grabbed the shard. When the guards came running into the auction room, the philosopher's stone was already gone. The girl had time to hide. Yuri could not escape through the door, so she decided to go out the window. While the guards were giving orders, the protagonist escaped through the window with the help of a spider's web. When Yuri was free, she remembered that it seemed that while the shard was flying towards her, it had hit something. The girl had not imagined it. As the stone flew across the hall, it crashed into the red-haired man's deer mask. He was sitting up now, rubbing his bruised forehead. The man with the long red hair sat there thinking that Damon and Yuri were supposed to meet here. He heard someone arguing from the side of the room. It was an alchemist. He shouted, throwing his frog mask to the auction worker, that it was not the philosopher's stone. The man he arrived at the auction with tried to calm him down. The worker warned him that he could get in trouble if he made a disturbance. The man with the blue hair got even angrier, but then the guy with the deer mask intervened. He asked him to stop freaking out, and since he had grown up, he should stop making scandals if things didn't go his way. The alchemist recognized the man immediately. It was Zines Sheldon. Damon wondered what he was doing at the auction. He thought the rumored place was a mess, but seeing him here, the level of the place was obvious to him. Zines was not in debt, and said that it was nothing compared to the level of a man who was making a scandal as if he were in his own home. They glared angrily at each other. Demon Salvatore turned around and threw Sheldon that he was just an abandoned dog capable of only barking. Zines didn't answer anything. Sitting back in his chair and taking off his deer mask, he stomped on Damon's mask with his foot and then said that he was amused to watch his tantrum at the auction because he had raised the price of the stone on purpose. The alchemist and his companion stood wide-eyed, staring at Sheldon. The red-haired man took the frog mask from Damon's friend and put it on himself, saying that it was funny to watch him, but there was no way he could have guessed that someone would steal the stone. The alchemist stood humiliated and pissed off. The red-haired man headed for the exit contentedly, thinking he could go to the festival. The worm in the man's head was excited about the fair. He wanted to eat everything that was being sold there, but Lachios had had enough. The demon asked where the blonde man got the money. The money was either from the man's pocket or from the girl's purse. The man was just stealing from the people who came to the party to have fun. Lachios said with crazy eyes that they should be grateful to him because he could have killed them. The worm was just stunned at that. Lachios took the ice cream. Worm remembered Yuri, or rather her food. He thought the food in the east was terrible, but it was just the girl's disgusting cooking. The man tried to defend the girl. He wanted to say that her food was delicious, but he didn't finish. Lachios threw away the ice cream and went into a dark alley. He wanted to find Yuri. Lachios jumped on the roof of the house. He cared about which man Yuri went to the festival with. Worm asked him what he was going to do when he found him. 
The man, without much thought, said he was going to kill him, of course. But no sooner had he finished speaking than some person rushed past him. It was Yuri, but the man didn't know it was her, of course. The girl turned around to look and recognized Lakios. The man had a crazed expression on his face. Yuri already thought he recognized her in the mask. The spring festival was in full swing in the city. Anne-Marie and her sister, Hestia, were at the festival. The girl had already suggested that they go slowly to the tower, but a woman called out to them. They approached her. The acquaintance gave Hestia a coin to go and buy something tasty. The sister ran to buy another lizard on a stick. The woman asked Anne-Marie where the Swan family bookstore was. The girl decided to chat with the woman until her companion returned. A girl bought herself a lizard on a stick. Suddenly she saw someone hiding behind a crate. Hestia thought it was a puppy. The werewolf wanted to eat the lizard, but if he went out, people would see him. And if he got caught, he wouldn't be able to keep his promise to Yuri. A sweet lizard on a stick appeared right in front of his face. The boy was delighted and took a bite of it. The girl didn't expect this, but she didn't say anything and just greeted him. Leo was startled. He was so focused on the tasty treat that he didn't notice the person next to him. Lakios and Yuri stood across from each other, the girl already thinking she had gotten him. But the man suddenly said that she was giving off a nasty energy. The black-haired girl decided that it was completely ungrateful of him. After all, she was considered his savior. She was angry with him. But the man was more concerned with what she had hidden in her pocket. He felt the power of the shard. The girl realized he wasn't talking about her, but about the stone. Lakios didn't stop, and the girl turned to leave. Yuri thought it was best for her to leave now, just in time to go to Anne-Marie's meeting and buy melon candy for Leo. But Lakios was not going to let her go so easily. The man attacked Yuri from behind, but she dodged him. Lakios swung at the girl, but she deflected the blow and ran away from him. The man caught up to her in midair. He couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman, so he wanted to take off her mask. Lakios plowed Yuri onto the roof of the house, many cracks appearing beneath them. Looking closely at the man's eyelashes, the worm discerned a woman's facial features beneath the mask. The man looked and realized she looked familiar. His blue-black hair, he felt a familiar sensation. He was about to take off his mask, but the girl intercepted his arm and knee him in the face. She toppled him over and was on top of him, using the webbing to tie him up. All this time a worm was screaming in the blonde's head. It was asking to use the power of the shard. After all, the girl was just a short distance away. But Lakios did not agree, because this ability is set to kill. If you failed the adjustment, you could accidentally kill, and he didn't want to, because then they wouldn't be able to get the information. They argued some more. The man just didn't want to hurt this girl because she seemed familiar to him. Specifically, he thought it was Yuri, but wasn't sure. While Lakios was thinking, the girl was already gone. She had escaped. The man tore the web. Yuri was surprised that he tore her web so quickly. She couldn't hide from him, so she had to change into her clothes and blend in. As Yuri descended, a familiar figure stood in the blind alley. It was Anne-Marie. The girl fell over in surprise and stared at the masked man with frightened eyes. Ten minutes ago, Leo and Hestia stood looking at each other. The boy was confused and upset that he had caught the man, for he had promised Yuri to be careful. The girl couldn't tell if it was a puppy or a kitty. Leo stood there, afraid of what would happen when Yuri found out. He didn't want to be scolded. The boy could not stand it and ran away. Hestia ran after him. Anne-Marie waited for her companion, but the woman who had called them was saying goodbye to each other. The girl turned to Hestia, but she was not there. Only a mask remained of her sister. Yuri stood staring at Anne-Marie. She didn't understand how she could show up at the exact moment Lakios was chasing her. I guess that's the power of a protagonist, always getting into trouble. Anne-Marie, sitting on the pavement, was afraid that her sister could have been taken by such a man. But then Lakios appeared in the alley. The girl thought that if she told the events that happened in the book, that Anne-Marie was the main character, who might fall in love with him but she imagined for herself not the happiest ending. So she decided it was a bad idea. Yuri decided that it was likely that Lakios would want to take out witnesses, namely Anne-Marie. 
so she grabbed the girl, pointed the web at the pursuer, and escaped with the white-haired woman herself. The man defended himself, but as it turned out, he was not targeted. The man heard voices. He jumped to the roof and saw two masked men. They were talking about the philosopher's stone. The men, having found nothing, decided to go back. Lachios was surprised to hear about the philosopher's stone. Meanwhile, the girl was standing on the roof of some house. Anne-Marie was still in her arms. Yuri didn't want to kill him, but only to defend herself. It was Lachios Avalon, after all. Anne-Marie was startled, but in the next instant she jumped up, remembering her sister. The white-haired girl begged to be let go, for she had to find Hesti. The masked girl promised to take her to her sister. Yuri's web can be used for a variety of purposes, hunting, traveling, and tracking. For tracking, it's not visible to the human eye, and it can stretch indefinitely, so it's extremely effective. The girl had attached one strand each to Anne-Marie and Hestia in the lead-up to the festival. So Yuri, with the help of the web, was able to find Hestia without difficulty. The girl led Anne-Marie to the place where her sister was now. Before leaving, Yuri apologized to the girl. Anne-Marie wanted to stop her but didn't have time. She thought her voice and eyes sounded familiar, and her hair was black, but it didn't matter now. She had to find Hestia. The girl was sitting alone in a dark alley. She had lost sight of the boy and was completely lost. Anne-Marie happily ran up to her sister, and they embraced. The girl started to scold Hestia for disappearing, but then the fireworks started. It was already nine o'clock. The sisters hurried to meet Yuri. The girl had already changed into her usual clothes. She decided not to give the shard to the customer, but to tell him that it didn't work out. The protagonist didn't know what to do. If she went home to hide the shard of ruins, she would be late to meet Anne-Marie and Hestia. But if she left the stone with her, there was a risk of getting caught by Lachios. Then it would be very bad. But then Leo suddenly caught her eye, hiding in a deserted alleyway. Yuri called the boy, and he jumped with fear, because he could get a lot from her. He kept imagining how the main character would scold him, and Odin would mock him. Leo was already ready to receive. Clamping his eyes shut, he waited. But unexpectedly for him, the girl was not angry, quite the opposite. She was glad that she met Leo and asked him to take the shard and come back first. The boy didn't immediately realize what the girl was asking of him. Yuri took Leo by the shoulders and asked him to be careful and not to let other people see him. She stroked his hair. The boy immediately brightened up and agreed to help the girl. They agreed to see each other later. Yuri arrived at the meeting place. The sisters approached the girl. The black-haired girl noticed that Hestia was in no mood. She was scolded. Anne-Marie apologized that they were a little late, but the girl said that she herself had just walked up. The white-haired girl noticed that the girl had very different clothes than the masked man had. Yuri asked Hestia what was wrong with her. The girl asked in surprise how she knew. The black-haired girl replied that it was written all over her face. Anne-Marie stood, remembering that masked man and comparing him to Yuri, noticing that she had just been shown. The girl laughed. The girls were admiring the fireworks. Anne-Marie glanced at Yuri. The girl was standing there watching the bright flashes of fireworks. The white-haired girl pulled the main character to pay attention to her. She thanked the girl for coming. 